Okay, let's move on with our weather theory series. Um, up to this point, we've talked about uh, obviously the big picture, why weather patterns um, exist around Earth, how they flow, what the air masses are doing uh, as far as low and high pressure air masses. Um, and uh, we spent a good deal of time in the last video talking about stability of the atmosphere how it relates to um, you know weather characteristics as, as well as air masses and, and how weather characteristics are uh, are within different types of air masses cold air masses warm air masses uh, things of that nature um, we're going to move on and uh, get uh, get even more granular as far as uh, different types of weather uh, within specific air masses um, and pressure systems and talk about clouds, uh, different types of cloud families, uh, things as they relate to your uh, flight planning, um, what you can expect as a, as, a, as a pilot as you're flying through some of these different uh, clouds. And then we'll also start our discussion on thunderstorms um, because that happens to be a very, very important uh, topic when it comes to flight planning and um, you know flying from point A to point B. So, um, so first off, uh, the reason that I think and uh, many pilots think that clouds are a uh, fantastic thing is because they happen to be a really, really good indicator of atmospheric stability and uh, future weather. So what you can expect to see in an air mass as far as weather characteristics go. Um, and so if I'm flying along, um, just as a, a point of emphasis and example, if I'm flying along in that picture on the left, and that, that cloud, by the way, on the left is probably 15,000, maybe 20,000 feet thick from top to bottom, uh, which, you know, that's indicative of a very, uh, a, a very thick cloud, a lot of vertical development. Uh, that's, a, that's a weather term, vertical development. We've already talked about how vertical development may not be a good thing as far as atmospheric stability goes. Um, so if I'm flying along in that picture on the left, I know because I see a lot of that vertical development and uh, cumulus cloud, I know that flying into that region could be pretty convective, uh, could see some, some bumps, some turbulence, um, just because I know that the lapse rate of the atmosphere in that region is probably pretty aggressive. It's probably, you know, higher than two degrees per thousand feet because look at how uh, how much vertical development that cloud has. So um, really two major ingredients to have a cloud. You have to have moisture in the air because that's the visible portion of the cloud. And you have to have a method to cool the air to or below the dew point. And so um, again, uh, in order for the moisture to be physically present so that you can see it and touch it, the uh, you have to bring that that pocket of air to the dew point. You have to bring it to its hundred percent moisture content point to the point where the air can no longer handle any more moisture. It's it's going to become visible. It's going to condense, and so you need that moisture and you need to bring the uh, air temperature to the dew point. And then beyond that, uh, like we kind of touched on just a second ago, the stability of the atmosphere, how quickly the air currents are moving vertically. Um, you know, the density of the air, the temperature lapse rate, things that we've discussed before, that stability will determine what type of cloud is, is formed. Once you have that moisture and once you have it condensed, uh, atmospheric stability will determine what type of cloud you're going to get. And so let's walk through a couple of different families um, and definitions. And so you can see we've got uh, low clouds, We've got middle clouds, and we've got high clouds, and, and these are some cloud families that you've probably just seen in everyday life, right? Um, <clears throat> and you've got clouds that produce a lot of moisture, a lot of rain. You've got clouds that don't produce any, you know, for example, nim nimbo, nimbo clouds. So nimbo stratus down there in the low cloud family um, tend to have a very high moisture content, tend to produce rain or ice, depending on the temperature. Um, and then you've got, uh, you know, cirrus clouds. So the wispy clouds that you see way, way up there in the atmosphere, um, where it happens to probably be too 
too too cold for any sort of real um, you know real significant uh, moisture condensation development. You're not going to get a lot of rain out of a cirrus cloud. Um, and then you've got a couple different cloud families um, right there uh, in the middle in the middle clouds. Um, so you know really the bottom line clouds are defined by um, kind of like a, a low middle high class and then they have different families um, and the, really the, the main families that we concern ourselves with uh, have to do with really the stability and the environment that they're produced in um, so <clears throat> Cumulus clouds, white puffy clouds, um, whether that be uh, down in the low cloud uh, region or up in the middle cloud or up high, um, cumulus clouds tend to, um, you know, generate in a unstable environment. And so, like the white puffy clouds you see on the hot Texas day when you've got high moisture content, that would be an unstable type cloud. Um, stratus clouds. Uh, kind of the clouds you see on a gray, maybe foggy or rainy day, um, those tend to generate in a more stable atmosphere environment. And so the, uh, the result of your flight, the comfort, potentially comfort of your flight will be impacted by uh, what type of clouds you have uh, along your route of flight. And then to the right, um, there's, you know, the cumulonimbus cloud. It kind of lives within all three different zones, low, middle, and high, depending on its maturity stage. Um, and those are thunderstorm clouds. Um, those are, again, cumulus type clouds, so indicative of a unstable atmosphere. Um, and they are, uh, they live in all regions. So uh, you won't be flying your Cessna 172 over the top of a cumulant in this cloud, potentially. So let's go through, um, kind of each different type just one by one um, and you know where this where this is important um, you know the the examiner during your flight test uh, is not going to expect you to be a, uh, a meteorologist or any sort of weather expert but they're going to expect you to understand from a risk management standpoint what these cloud families what these uh, weather patterns are going to do to your flight so you can plan accordingly so that you can have backup plans potentially. Um, <clears throat> but let's, we'll walk through each one of these and kind of talk about how they might impact your, your flight planning. Um, moist, stable air, and, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna approach these from a, from a air mass stability perspective, just because I think that makes the most sense when it comes to what type of flight you're gonna plan or, or, or you know, what type of flight you'll have. Um, so moist, stable air. So think about a gray, rainy day. You don't hear the birds chirping. Not much is going on. There's barely any wind. This is, this is stratus type clouds. The gray, rainy day is a stratus type cloud situation. You're gonna, you know, if there's enough moisture in the air, you're gonna have steady precipitation. It's gonna be maybe steady precipitation for the entire time that the air mass is in the, is in the location. Um, and you're not going to have a lot of turbulence. There's not a lot of changing wind directions. There's, there's not a lot of wind to begin with. Um, <clears throat> it's just gray, rainy, and it's stratus clouds. Stratus clouds, steady precipitation, stable air mass. Unstable air mass, potentially high moisture content. These are your cumulus clouds, and um, if a cumulus cloud has reached, you know, a certain, I'd say, maturity state as far as moisture content goes. Say that the moisture has brought the um, <clears throat> has brought the air mass to the dew point. You're going to have precipitation, but it's going to be isolated. It's going to be in the location of the cloud. It's not going to be across the entire air mass. It's going to be what what we call showery. That's that's the term that the aviation community uses: showery precipitations you know, showers, it's isolated. You know, you're gonna have showers in the vicinity of the cloud, but 15 miles next to the cloud, it may be a nice clear day. Um, so um, we see this a lot in Texas, actually, um, in the springtime and the summertime, you get cumulus clouds build up, potential thunderstorms, uh, showers moving through the area. 
And this type of cloud development is uh, known to have moderate turbulence, maybe extreme turbulence. So as you're flying along or you're planning your flight, just know that you're probably not going to attempt to fly through the top of one of these um, very, very tall cumulus clouds if you have the option of flying around it potentially. Um, and so that's just uh, kind of the weather characteristics you'll see in the, in the cumulus type clouds. The FAA uh, is going to expect you as a pilot to uh, be able to estimate cloud heights and um, you know be able to determine where your clouds might be along a route of flight by knowing the temperature and the dew point spread at a certain location. Um, you know, using using atmospheric stability kind of uh, in your hip pocket. So I'm going to put up an example here just to kind of talk through one. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so kind of a couple bullet points before we look at the example. Um, given a lapse rate, so you kind of have to know whether your atmosphere is stable or unstable. So given a, a temperature lapse rate, um, you're going to be able to find um, the cloud bases and potential areas of, uh, call it condensed atmosphere, condensed moisture, uh, using a dew point spread. So the difference between a surface temperature and a dew point that you get out of, uh, you know, out of a weather report. Um, and <clears throat> you'll have these on your written test. The examiner may ask you to do one of these kind of on paper. But let's walk through a quick example. Um, so let's say the temperature at the surface uh, is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and we have a dew point of 61 degrees Fahrenheit. So, um, which is typical, right? You're going to have you're typically going to have your dew point spread be in that direction where your dew point is less than your temperature. Um, and so we have a nine degree spread between temperature and dew point. You can see I've got uh, got our clouds there uh, up there in the sky. So let's assume a two percent, or I'm sorry, two degree Celsius or a four four point four degree Fahrenheit per thousand foot lapse rate. That's going to be um, an unstable atmosphere. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Uh, four point four degree Fahrenheit is closer to a three degree uh, Celsius. That's going to be unstable lapse rate. That means we are actually decreasing in temperature more quickly in the atmosphere than we would like for a stable atmosphere. Um, and so we're going to expect, again, just drawing back on some of the things we've talked about, on stable atmosphere we're going to expect cumulus clouds because that's the type of cloud that forms in an unstable atmosphere. And we're going to go ahead and apply a formula that basically um, says based on our lapse rate if we decrease by 4.4 degrees per thousand feet so in other words to kind of walk through it manually temperature at the surface is 70 that means at a thousand feet it's going to be 65.6 if we take 4.4 off that first thousand feet and then the next thousand feet it's going to be uh, what 61.2 um, as we get closer and closer to our dew point essentially um, divide your temperature spread of 9 by 4.4, which is the lapse rate in our unstable uh, atmosphere, and we're going to get about 2,000 foot. That is the distance between the surface and the cloud bases, 2,000 feet. So you can use that lapse rate and that temperature spread to help you determine kind of where the clouds are going to be for your location. And it's very helpful if you're flying in between different uh, air masses and things of that nature. Of course, now you know nowadays we've got a lot of technology in the cockpit. You can look at weather reports real time. But this is uh, this is basically how the atmosphere works, given a lapse rate and a temperature dew point spread. And you'll be asked to to do this on your your written test at least. All right, let's dive into thunderstorms real quick. Um, we've talked, you know, briefly in the prior lesson about air masses and what type of weather to expect. Uh, we have touched on, obviously, by, by now it should be obvious that 
An unstable air mass is one at which there's extensive vertical development. And how do we get that extensive vertical development? Well, it's an unstable lapse rate. You know, so we've got uh, air moving vertically quickly and cooling quickly. So we've got the temperature dropping quickly in a given uh, vertical, you know, altitude. And um, if that if that air mass also has uh, sufficient moisture, then we are going to have uh, rain, thunderstorms, and poor weather. So let's just look at the basic ingredients of a thunderstorm. And this, again, just a hint for your written test and for your uh, flight test or oral exam. Um, in order to have a thunderstorm or any sort of aggressive convective rain activity, you're going to have to have moisture. You're going to have to have an unstable atmosphere, so unstable lapse rate. And you're going to have to have some sort of lifting mechanism. So, you know, vertical development. And yes, the lapse rate is a, <clears throat> is a me mechanism for vertical development, but there's also things that we've talked about such as temperature and uh, frontal boundaries, so cold fronts uh, coming to replace warm air masses, and potentially terrain in some areas of the country. So you have to have moisture, unstable lapse rate, and a lifting mechanism. And if you've got those three items, you're going to have the ingredients for a thunderstorm. And thunderstorms, um, even though when you're sitting on your back porch and a thunderstorm hits your neighborhood, it may seem like all of a sudden you just have a thunderstorm, but the thunderstorms, they do not just appear out of thin air. They actually generate over a period of minutes and hours, and they have different stages. So um, we'll walk through the different stages here. We've got the cumulus stage. So this is the white puffy cloud on a hot Texas day stage. You've got moisture that is being forced upwards vertically, aggressively, unstably, everything we've talked about. Our second stage is our mature stage. So this is the stage when you're sitting on your back porch and the thunderstorm comes and it hits you and, and it's got rain and lightning and a lot of wind, wind shear, things of that nature. Um, the unstable atmosphere has produced from that cumulus cloud a major thunderstorm. That cumulus cloud is probably tens of thousands of feet thick. So we're not flying over a mature thunderstorm. Um, and the thunderstorm is by definition at this stage producing precipitation, whether it be hail, freezing rain, rain, you name it. And then finally, the third and final stage is our dissipating stage. This is after the moisture content has run out, the atmosphere has potentially come back to a more stable state. It's not continually producing more vertical development and bringing more moisture um, up into the atmosphere it has finished more or less and this is your dissipating stage um, as it relates to your flying um, the dissipating stage is characterized by a lot of downdrafts so if you're flying in the vicinity of a dissipating thunderstorm you can expect maybe a lot of headwinds a lot of shear meaning uh, wind that's um, you know changing direction and speed quickly so uh, although it may be obvious that you do not want to fly through the mature stage of a thunderstorm. You may also want to try to avoid by some distance the dissipating stage of a thunderstorm um, and, and try to uh, you know, stay away from the potential uh, wind shear hazards that are associated. <clears throat> and then finally, just to wrap up on a couple comments here with thunderstorms as they relate to probably our, our local flying here. I tried to pick some more local locations. Um, there's generally just a couple types of thunderstorms that you'll run into. One we like to call isolated or steady state thunderstorms. Some people like to call them pop-up thunderstorms. So like if you live in Florida, Florida gets hit with a lot of pop-up thunderstorm activity. Just all of a sudden on a nice sunny day, you'll be sitting in your driveway and a thunderstorm will just over, you know, many minutes or hours will just generate just right there. It'll have the sufficient atmospheric instability and moisture content and lifting action to just generate a thunderstorm right there. Um, and this is what a radar return might look like 
for an isolated steady state thunderstorm, just little pockets of isolated thunderstorms. The second type of thunderstorm um, is what we call a, a frontal thunderstorm or a squall line. These are thunderstorms that are moving um, in advance of, typically in advance of a front where you've got extreme, extremely um, different weather characteristics in one air mass overtaking the weather characteristics of another air mass. And usually, not always, but most typically, you've got a cold front with um, sufficiently cool, dry air coming to overtake, aggressively overtake, in some, in, you know, in, in some circumstances, a warmer air mass with sufficient moisture to create very, very violent thunderstorms that we like to call a squall line. And if you live in Texas, um, you are very familiar with these. These are the um, very, very, very long thunderstorms that are uh, in front of, in most cases, cold fronts. As cold fronts make their way through the Texas landscape um, and cause all sorts of havoc, tornadoes, hail, you know, major wind, you know, straight line wind events, things of that nature, flooding. Um, so how does it relate to your flying? Well, isolated steady state thunderstorms generally, um, you know, are, are easier to deal with uh, as far as navigating around them. But pop-up steady state thunderstorms can literally generate out of, you know, out of nowhere if there's the right ingredients. Squall line thunderstorms are, uh, in general, a little bit easier to, um, you know, see coming. They're easier to forecast for, for weather forecasters because it, you know, it generally um, follows the track of a uh, frontal boundary. But uh, in no way do you want to find yourself out flying around when a squall line is coming through the area. Absolutely not. Um, and they're also near impossible to navigate around in a, in a propeller-driven area airplane. So, um, so yeah, these are the two types of thunderstorms we typically deal with. Um, and uh, whether, whether you find yourself in one of the two, you absolutely do not want to fly through them. You want to keep a 15, 20, 25 nautical mile distance from any thunderstorm activity.